All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Equip Institute Apologetics. Um, just a real quick uh, re- uh, announcement. If you were hoping to get popcorn, there's only one bag left, so go get it now. Uh, don't want anyone to feel like your, your night was ruined. Hey, so I'm Jeff Moore. I am the groups pastor here at Austin Ridge. I also serve with Equip and help with all the Institute stuff. So, oh. All right. It's great. This is the best class already. Uh, how, how many of you guys are repeat um, offenders of this class, or repeat uh, students? Okay, we, we have a few. So you've been to apologetics before. Okay, awesome. Uh, have you all been to other institute classes? Theology, Bible overview, cool. How many of you all, this will, oh, I know you have. How, how many of you all, this will be like completing the circuit, and you all will be institute graduates at the end of this? Okay, that's some fresh faces. Okay, good. Well, you're in for uh, what we think is a treat for the next eight weeks. Uh, I'll preface the next eight weeks by saying you're not going to learn anything and everything you ever wanted to learn under the sun and be able to walk into a a college uh, debate hall and win the debate with a Muslim or Jehovah's Witness or an atheist or anything like that. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to increase our understanding not only of what God's Word says but how we can articulate God's Word in relationships, okay? So keep that as kind of your guiding uh, hope through all this, and just press in and learn. I mean, do the reading, uh, listen well, take notes, hang out after class and ask questions, come early the next week and ask questions. Uh, Feel free to email me or Joey anytime uh, you have questions throughout the week as things come up, because we want to serve you and help you uh, so that this just isn't a box that you check, but this really does make an impression on you for the long haul as you walk with Jesus, okay? The big part about this is you're going to learn how to uh, kind of defend the faith even to yourself, because we all have doubts. We all have things we're, that we try to wrestle with, and things will spike in our lives, and, and the type of things you're going to learn here in the next couple of months are going to help you do that as well. So it's not just about somebody else. It's also about your own walk and your own heart, okay? So um, any quick questions before I introduce our speaker for tonight? Anything I can help you with? Great. Okay, so uh, the next four weeks, the teachers that you have, tonight you have Gary Run. He's one of our elders here at Austin Ridge. Uh, John Craig is back there. He's going to be teaching a few weeks uh, on tactics. It's kind of his area of specialty. Uh, Brett Boyd, did Brett come in? No, Brett's not here tonight. Uh, Brett will be teaching a couple weeks as well. And then we have a guy, uh, Randy Goodall. He's teaching the very last week on faith and science. Uh, Randy and Joy used to, his wife, Joy, used to go to Austin Ridge. They've, um, in the past year, they've moved actually out of the area a little bit, but he's coming back to teach that class. So we're going to try to actually get a good video of that night because he's so exceptionally gifted and skilled at the faith and science topic that we want to make sure we capture that so that so the next year's class can also hear from him. So uh, anyway, we're excited about that. And uh, really, I don't want to take any more of Gary's time because he's got a lot to unload on you guys, and I want to give him ample time. Uh, there will be a break kind of about halfway into the night, so if you feel like uh, you need to excuse yourself, you might wait another five or ten minutes, and you'll probably get a break, and you can go do whatever you, whatever you need to do. Uh, tonight, we should be letting you out of here by 8.15 at, at the very latest. Yeah, our goal each week is to start at 6.30. We know that work and traffic and all those types of things are out of your control, so we just have a little bit of a buffer if needed. But as close to 6.30 as we can start, it really helps the teachers uh, get through the content that, 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 they, that they prepared for y'all. Um, and, but yeah, so 6.30 to 8 each, or 8.15 each week. So I'm going to pray, and then Gary's going to come up, and you guys are going to learn, okay? So God, we thank you for tonight, and we thank you. Uh, just always excited to see uh, our church show up for this stuff. And pray uh, that your Holy Spirit would guide everything that's said, everything that's heard. Uh, and especially everything that's lived out because of the things that are learned in this space. God, for the next eight weeks, would you be uh, very, very present with us, and would you uh, protect us, would you guide us, would you lead us uh, into truth, and uh, would you use these men uh, to, to teach us well? And uh, we just pray all this, Jesus, in your great name. Amen. This is Gary Run. Thank you. <laughs> I don't need to. Yeah. No, thanks, Jeff, and it's so glad that you guys are here. I'm really, really grateful that you're here. I hope you can make it all eight weeks. There's some excellent content, especially that comes after me. Tonight is a little bit of an introduction, so we can talk about what apologetics is. Um, A little bit more about myself. Uh, My more famous part of the family is my wife regarding the church, because she's the women's director here at Bee Cave, so my wife is Carrie Run, and I kind of stay in the background. But I do have the privilege of serving on the elder board, which is a great privilege. And every now and then I get to come in and help out with Equip, which I'm really grateful for that too. So let me start off by asking you a question, and I actually want you to respond back to me, even as a large group. We're going to try a little bit of interaction tonight and see how it goes. 
But here's the first question. What are you hoping to get out of this class? It's a class on apologetics. What are you hoping to get out of it? What do you want to walk away with? Give me some feedback. What are your thoughts? Okay, tools to defend the faith. Okay, what else? Okay, help people to come to Christ. Great. What else? Okay, so being able to ask questions well, which I think precludes really that you're entering into a dialogue and have a conversation about these things. Okay, great. What else? Yes, just to build your own confidence, right? Uh, and that may be the most important aspect is, is our, faith, our faith resting on a sure foundation. Do we fully understand what we say we believe? Good. I saw a hand somewhere over here. Yeah. Yeah, how do you say things? What do you say, especially how, so that you don't turn people off? And John's taking the next two weeks to talk about tactics, so you'll get an opportunity to to think about some of those things. Really important. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and she mentioned that her, she has a friend that keeps challenging her on the veracity of the Bible. How does she answer her? How can she begin to give a reasonable explanation about the truth of Scripture and that it is reliable? Great. Anything else come to mind? What you're hoping to get out of our time? Oh, I'm sorry. You're so far up front. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. She just mentioned she's hoping to find a way to approach her grandchildren. And that is powerful because the faith, uh, especially when you look at it through the lens of the Old Testament, is a legacy faith, isn't it? There's a historical aspect to it, not just to what we believe, but what we hand down. So I appreciate that. Well, uh, many years ago, won't say how many, but many years ago, I took seminary uh, classes and got a Master's of Divinity degree at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School up in Chicago. And before I went to Trinity, I went to a few friends that I knew that were already there, and I said, hey, what do I need to know before I get here? How would you give me some tips or some help to prepare me for my time at Trinity? And what I was really looking for was, hey, what classes should I take or not take? What professor should I avoid? <laughs> Are there any tricks or tips about studying this kind of stuff? Because this is different than anything else I've studied. And I got none of that. Matter of fact, three themes stood out immediately, and I've never forgotten them. One, people tell me is don't lose your devotional life. And that kind of surprised me. I thought, wait a minute, I, I'm coming to seminary for three years. Isn't it all about your devotional life? And they're like, no, academia, well, if you let it, will kill it really quickly. And so you've got to hold on to your walk with the Lord and stay committed to your devotional life so that you remain intimate with Him while you're doing all this great academic work. It's like, okay, I'm going to tuck that away. That surprised me. Second thing was this, don't put God in a box. And I had to ask, what do you mean by that? I said, well, there's a tendency in academia uh, to limit God, that God is only this and no more, and we can figure God out. And if I just get this degree, you know, that kind of takes care of my understanding of God. I said, don't do that. You know, they said, you cannot put God in a box. He's far greater than that. That was really helpful. And finally, the last thing that sounds similar, uh, the other theme was this, don't put God on the operating table either. Meaning he's not something to be dissected. He's not something to be, again, figured out or determined by us. He is wholly other. Uh, in one sense, he's knowable, and we know that, right, at a personal level. In another sense, he's completely unknowable to us as long as we're on this side of heaven. There's so much more to know. The vastness of God, the greatness of God. We can't put him on the operating table. We can't put him on a bo in a box uh, and even as we talk about apologetics for eight weeks, uh, this doesn't substitute, obviously, for our devotional life. That still what he longs for us to do is to draw close to him and to be intimate with him as we walk with him daily. So let me uh, kind of give you a forecast of where we're headed this evening. And you can look to the screen, but um, really almost everything is in your notes. We set it up in such a way that the slides that are on the screen are just kind of markers so you know where we are in the notes. So let me kind of give you a pathway uh, for where we're headed this evening. 
First, we're going to look at one particular passage of the Bible. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And so if you want to, you can already begin uh, making sure you get to that part of your Bible or on your phone or in a book. But we're going to look at 1 Peter 3 and take a look um, at this word apologetics. Second, we're going to provide some definitions. What does this word actually mean? It's nuanced. There's more than one definition to this idea of apologetics and, and how we think about it. Uh, third, what's the necessity of it? Why does it matter that we actually study this topic and try and get a handle over eight weeks around everything that we'll, we'll cover? Uh, fourth, we're going to take a look at a little bit of current research. What's our current culture like in relation to the faith journey, in relation to Christianity in particular, and how might apologetics fit into this current cultural moment. And therefore, finally, we're going to look at some 21st century realities. It will, we'll touch lightly and give you kind of a taste of what John will go over more specifically in the next couple of weeks, but we'll touch lightly on what's the approach look like in light of the 21st century reality. And so those are the things that we're going to cover tonight. We will take a break at about 7.15. I've got a big clock right up on the wall in front of me, so I'll pay attention to that. So you get a break, and then as uh, Jeff mentioned, we'll be done by by 8.15. So let's start with um, 1 Peter 3. And we'll give you a little bit of a backdrop to this passage. I think it always is helpful to know the context, in this case of the book itself, uh, the audience, and then where this particular passage sits. But the audience of, of 1 Peter and when the Apostle Peter was writing was really a scattered group of house churches in Asia Minor. So if you think of where Asia Minor might be today, think of the country of Turkey. Turkey would encompass most of what was known as Asia Minor then. Matter of fact, many of the cities that are mentioned in 1 Peter, you can still find today in the country of Turkey. You can visit those historic sites, and I've, I've been to a few, which is, is really fun to do. But a couple other things to know about this audience. These house churches were made up both of uh, Gentile and Jewish believers. So mixed ethnicity in that regard, as far as these house churches were concerned. They were spread out. They were somewhat scattered. And they were under some form, as far as we know, of sporadic persecution from Rome. Most scholars don't believe that it was the persecution of Domitian or some of the other emperors that were much more systemic and thorough, but there was some sporadic persecution that was going on throughout the empire because it threatened emperor worship and a variety of other things that Rome was most interested in. And so these house churches in Asia Minor were experiencing some of that. Therefore, the primary theme, I think, of all of 1 Peter is suffering. To be more specific, it's about where's our hope in the midst of suffering. Because these house churches were experiencing this persecution. Uh, what does it actually look like to go through that, to maintain our hope in Jesus, and to still actually be a good witness at the same time? What does all of that look like? And it's interesting in our current day culture, uh, we'll talk more about this as I mentioned when we get to the 21st century realities, I'm not sure we're that far removed anymore from that experience again, the way things are transpiring in the Western world. So I think it has relevance to us as we think about apologetics in light of potential suffering. And we all experience suffering to one degree or another. Let me adjust the mic there go a little bit. So let's look at this particular passage, 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 17. Peter's already introduced this concept of suffering all the way back in chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I know you are grieved by various trials right now. But then he attaches a so that to it. He gives a purpose to the trials early on. And so verse 7 gives the purpose in chapter 1 that the purpose of various trials are for the testing of our faith, that they might result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus, meaning when Jesus comes again. And I don't know if you often think about trials that way or different elements of suffering that way, but Peter postures it in such a way that it's, it's really about our joy. It's about praise and glory and honor to Jesus. And Peter goes on to say, because that's for two reasons. One, we love Him. And two, we believe in Him. We love Him and we believe in Him, meaning Jesus. And this begins to get us into the realm of apologetics because what is the content of our faith? What is it that we actually say that we believe? 
What does salvation and our walk with the Lord actually stand upon? We have to know those things, I believe, at a bedrock level, especially to carry us through times of trial and suffering. And so this is what Peter's saying as he addresses them. And then he goes on in chapter 2, uh, and he begins to tell them that the first thing you have to understand in the midst of persecution is not only that Jesus suffered too, and actually Peter's going to mention this twice, don't forget that your Savior himself suffered on your behalf. But he quotes an Old Testament passage in the middle of chapter 2, and he says, don't forget also that Jesus is a stone of offense, a rock of offense. No matter how winsome you want to be, no matter how reasonable your arguments are, no matter how hard you try to love people right where they are, some will still stumble over the person of Jesus. It's just part of the truth of Scripture that He Himself is a stumbling block to some. And it's not necessarily our fault. Uh, It's simply they stumble over this idea that Jesus could be God and that He is King of kings and Lord of lords and therefore fall short of maybe receiving the gospel. And so Peter reminds these hearers of that reality. But he also reminds them that they're a chosen people. They are God's people. Uh, they exist for a purpose. And he calls them sojourners and exiles in this world. And so part of First Peter, in the midst of this theme of hope, in the midst of suffering, is how are we to live as exiles and sojourners? Sojourner just means we're passing through, we're, we're pilgrims on the way. Exiles is what it sounds like. We're in a country that's not our own, meaning this world. We actually have another home. And so we have dual citizenship. But Peter's helping us see that there's an exile way of life, and we are all part of that exile group as we attempt to live out our faith in this fallen world. When we get to chapter 3 at the first part, he reminds them once again that Christ has suffered already. This is not a unique experience for them. And then it gets to our specific passage. So let's read it, starting in verse 18, and we'll get to the key word that we need to look at. Starting in verse 8, Peter says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. So far, he's talking about our posture. Again, don't lose sight of the context. In the midst of persecution from the government that oversaw them, he's saying there's a posture that matters. As you live on exile, there's a particular way in which you are to live. And it's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? Certainly to the world. Then in verse 10, he actually quotes Psalm 34. This is a quotation from the psalm, Psalm 34, and he goes on, verse 10, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil." So one of the things that Peter's doing, he's using the Old Testament to affirm them. Listen, God hasn't abandoned you in the midst of your suffering. He's always in tune with you. He's always attuned to you and your needs. He hears your prayer, and his righteousness will prevail for those who are righteous. But he also says he hasn't forgotten that there's evil in the world, that he knows what they're up against. Then as we turn to verse 13, it says, Now, Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? So he's still talking about our conduct, kind of the context of how we might defend the faith. And then in verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. And then here's our key verse for the evening. But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. But go back to verse 15. He says a couple of things here that really matter for this evening. 
It says, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy. The first thing he tells us again, not only is our posture of our conduct, how we're to be humble of mind, humble of, uh, of outward expression, doing good towards those even who revile us, but he's saying there's a posture of heart. That first and foremost, we have to see the Lord Jesus as holy other. And usually when we see this concept of really something the Old Testament talks a lot about, the fear of the Lord, and I think this would stand in concert with that thinking, the fear of the Lord is simply realizing He is holy other, we are not, therefore we put all our hope and trust in Him. He is the Alpha and Omega, He is the beginning and the end, He is the eternally existent one that has no beginning or no end. He stands apart, He is holy other, and therefore we put all our hope and trust in in Him, because He's the Creator, we're the created. Uh, we depend upon Him. But then He goes further after that posture of heart, and again He says, always being prepared to make a defense. And there's our key word, that word defense in the Greek is apologia, where we get our word apologetics. Apologia. He says, be ready to make this apologia for the hope that is in you. Often this verse, I think, is somewhat taken out of context. It's often used for evangelism classes and how to share your faith, but we tend to remove it from the context of suffering and persecution. Uh, we kind of take it as a side principle that, hey, you should just learn apologetics or you should learn how to defend the faith so that you can be a better witness. And, and that's, that's true. But never forget that it's tied to hope. Hope is always future-oriented, it's always anticipating something that's not yet realized. It looks ahead to something that's sure and true. And so we're giving a defense, an apologia for the hope that resides within us, even though the world may be persecuting us. So it's not fight or flight. That's not a response to persecution or suffering. It's a reasonable defense that surrounds hope the content of our faith that gives us the hope of our faith because it points to someone who is holy other. And that's really at the heart of it, I think as Peter understands it, what apologetics is really about. And when you take that word and begin to divide it a little bit more, which we'll do in a minute, uh, you'll see there's some richness to it and it begins to even inform not only what we're to defend, but how. And so again, finally we take a look at this word apologia, and it means, I'll give you right off the bat two things, it's two sides of the same coin, it's in your notes. It means a defense, which often implies vindication, justification, think of a courtroom type scene, but it also has the dual meaning of discourse, a conversation. Apologetics is about defense and discourse. I don't think you can unlink those two. It's understanding that our faith rests on something sure, but we're able to converse about it. And we're able to converse in a way that still shows respect and humility and love, even while being reviled. Matter of fact, I would make the case that's part of the defense. How do you know if something's really real if people don't have a different approach to what they say? If you're claiming the name of Jesus and that your life's been transformed, but you're arguing like a raving lunatic <laughs> about the faith, maybe it's not so real. But if you're able to stand sure on your faith and have a conversation, a defense and a dialogue, a defense and a discourse, then I think you've got a substantive whole of what we mean by this idea of apologetics. And so it's right there in 1 Peter. It is in this context of suffering, but it points to a hope and it points to a certain hope. And he goes on in chapter 4 and returns to the idea of how do you practically live while suffering. So we have to get down to some real definitions and do, go a little bit deeper into this. But let me stop and ask you a question before we go there again. So this time I just want you to turn to one or two people. It could just be the person right next to you. I know you're in a classroom style setting, so it's a little hard to have a big group discussion. But just turn to one or two people, and uh, I want you to answer this question, discuss it for just a minute. What role do you think apologetics actually plays for a suffering church community? 
What role does apologetics play? That's the context of what we just looked at. What role does apologetics actually play or could play for a suffering church community? And by the way, not just from persecution, but there are members of our body in this church that are suffering every week in a variety of ways, and probably some of you are, whether it's relationally or health-wise or a variety of other things. What role does apologetics play in a suffering body? So just talk about that with the person next to you for a few minutes, and then I'll, I'll bring us back together. Crazy. Glasses will be there. Okay, let me bring you back together. Um, what were some of the things you came up with? What are some thoughts around what the role of apologetics could play in a suffering community? Yeah. Say that again. Provide comfort. Yeah, to provide comfort. And how do you think that would happen? How would that provide comfort? With hope. The hope of what we say we believe and what we stand upon. Yeah. Okay, using reason, intellect, and love, being able to articulate your hope in a reasonable way. Great, in a loving way. What else did y'all talk about? Uh-huh. Yeah. Good. Yeah, and she said it proves the authenticity and the genuineness of our faith. Because we're, we're, we're having to live it, not just talk about it, right? In the midst of suffering, you're kind of forced to, we might say, fish or cut bait back in the day. <laughs> is it real or is it not? Okay, yeah. The first line of apologetics is our action to how we live, mm. right? And then we get in turn the opportunity at times to, to have discourse and discussion. So okay. That's really what we're talking about. Yeah, and he's just saying the first line of our, our ability to even have faith conversations with others are actions. Yeah, great. Other thoughts? What else did you talk about? How else can apologetics serve a suffering community? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't catch all of that. Say it again. To encourage people? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I'll kind of make the case tonight that this is probably more for you than for them, whoever they are, <laughs> that are not in this room. It, it starts with us. 
is to make sure that our faith rests on something sure. Now, faith is still faith, meaning uh, we don't see God. I can't display him before you in the sense of a living being. So we still have faith, but we have a reasonableness to what we stake our claims upon, and that's what this eight-week class is really about. Okay, what else? Anything else? One more? Yeah? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and he's just saying apologetics can provide purpose to suffering and help us understand purpose behind the suffering. I think that's really, really true. And we see a little bit of that already in this letter, but there's there's so much more in the scriptures and in other ways uh, by example that we can validate that and see that it's true. Okay, great. I just want you to begin to keep thinking about these things as we begin to apply it to what not just this church was going through uh, back in the first century, but, but our lives. Uh, because in a broken world, we're still experiencing suffering of a variety of kinds. So what is apologetics? We've already mentioned this idea of defense and discourse. This comes not only from the Greek, but also from the Latin. Uh, this idea, again, that defense can be vindication and justica- justification, which is in your notes, based on evidence. That's the idea, even that we apply to courtroom law today, that there's enough evidence for vindication and justification. But as I mentioned earlier, there's this other side of the coin, it's conversation, it's discourse, and there's actually a content to our conversation. It's conversation around something, it's not conversation for conversation's sake. And yet, as Peter's already described, there is a posture that comes with that conversation. The goal isn't to win the argument. The goal isn't necessarily to have an argument in the classical way we tend to think about it. But the idea is that we can still do this with gentleness, respect, and even a good conscience before the Lord. Uh, That we're attempting to really come alongside people, not stand over them when we do this defense and discourse. And then also apologetics uh, has become known as a form of Christian theology. This began uh, in earnest with the, really the New Testament apostles. Uh, Paul in particular gives a lot of things that are become content for the reasonableness of our faith, but so do all the writers of the New Testament, either in the, the four Gospels that give indication of what Jesus did and what Jesus claimed, which we'll look at more as we walk through this eight-week course, uh, but others looking back at the life of Christ and looking forward to the life of the church and even forward to the second coming and beyond in the kingdom of God, the writers begin to build out a theology around what's the content of our faith, what are we to believe, what are we actually putting our hope in. So there is a form of Christian theology that began probably in total, with, or at least in part, with, uh, with the, the New Testament writers. Uh, beginning with historically with Augustine, it began to become more of a studied area of expertise as he began to lay down kind of some principles of apologetics and ways to have discourse and defend the faith. Uh, famous theologian Thomas Aquinas in history was also one of those that did a great job of principalizing the faith and, and uh, providing proofs for the faith. Uh, the reformers that came much later uh, were a part of that too. In, in our part of the world, in the Western world, even in the U.S. and in Western Europe, there were some popular scholars in the 19th century, so the 1800s, that began to... Uh, make this more of a codified field of study. So people like B.B. Warfield or Charles Hodge, you may have heard of some of those names, and they've written many books, uh, and they're known as those that were great apologists for the faith. Then in more recent times, the 20th century, and even to this day, uh, there's names like Cornelius Van Til, who you may know or may not know, but you might know the name C.S. Lewis, who took more of a philosophical approach in many ways uh, to providing content for faith. Um, Josh McDowell, who's still alive today and wrote a book that became very popular in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, uh, about what we stake our faith on. Norm Geisler, John's dad, William Lane Craig, R.C. Sproul. There are others that today, and R.C. Sproul just passed away a couple years ago, but his ministry goes on. um, They are ones that have really helped us continue in this line of thinking about how do we defend the faith, how do we have discourse around the faith and the content of our faith, Uh, through the study of apologetics. So it's really become a a field of study in Christian theology. Why is it necessary? Why is it necessary? Really, it's two things. We've kind of said this. It's our faith and their faith, very simply. But I think it begins with our faith. 
that our confidence will grow in what we say we believe and what we proclaim. And I think there's another thing that comes along with this. So you remember I mentioned when I talked about seminary that you can't put God in a box and you can't put him on the operating table. Really, all of theology should end up in one place when we study it. It should end up in worship. It's not just to expand our knowledge. It's not to look smarter. It's, again, not to put other people down or to win arguments. It really should humble us. It really should end up in worship to our God for how incredibly great he is. That we're only, even in eight weeks or even if you spend a lifetime, we're only gathering just a small piece of who he is and beginning to understand his greatness. And it should aid our worship. The more that we learn about him, the more that we learn what our faith rests upon, should swell up in even more worship to him from us. And that he's pleased with our worship as we get to know him and understand him better. But then certainly the faith of others. A little bit, I'm going to try and pinpoint uh, the kind of people I think that might be most open to apologetic discourse. But what we're really trying to do is help people evaluate truth claims. And let me also suggest we are trying to persuade. We're not just saying, hey, here's another opinion among the other thousand opinions you may know. We're, we're really actually trying to persuade. And Paul would say in First and Second Corinthians, we should be trying to persuade. Now, there's still a way to persuade with gentleness and respect and with love. Again, it doesn't mean just talking louder and faster and winning the argument. But we should be persuasive about what we believe, or at least trusting the Lord that we can be persuasive, that as we walk alongside people and we aid them in their faith journey, that they too might come to know the Savior that we know, that there is a reasonableness to this. And if those are the questions they're asking that are tripping them up, then there are answers. Still requires faith, uh, but we can provide a reasonableness to what we stake our claims on and what we believe. So let's talk a little bit about a cultural analysis. Ah, let's take a break. It's right at 7.15. Before we do that, take a break if you need one, if you need to run to the restroom, if you still need more coffee, more snacks. Less snacks. Less snacks. Go for it for a minute.
Okay, why don't we try and begin to take our seats and we'll start back. So if you wanna grab one more cup of coffee or bottle of water. So as you're coming back, let me ask you one more large group question. See if you can give me a little feedback. Which do you think is more important, defense or discourse? Yeah. <laughs> I was afraid somebody would say that. It is a little bit of a trick question. Yeah, they both matter, don't they? They really do both matter. I think the answer is yes. Um, how we go about it, as well as what we understand that we can say. Uh, but both what are we going to say and being persuasive, and how are we going to be persuasive? Um, we'll talk more about this as we begin to talk about some of the cultural realities and, and the context we, we live in today, um, but just to kind of get you thinking again you know, on that, that level. So let's do a little bit of talk about the cultural analysis. So a few years ago, um, I was a part of a large research project that was nationwide uh, and trying to figure out uh, evangelism in the context of the 21st century. What are we up against? What are the realities? Where are people? in regards to faith, how do they understand faith in general, how do they view the church, how do they view Jesus, um, how do they view the Christian faith in particular. And so there was a broad, a broad array of questions that were asked, and we, we did both qualitative and quantitative research. We hired a group out of Atlanta that was called the Cyrano Group, and was an excellent research firm. And they came back over about an 18-month period of research and gave us uh, a 400-page report, which we tried to uh, winnow down a little bit. Uh, but it produced some very tangible findings that we knew could be practical in helping all of us uh, navigate not only our faith, but then how do we communicate our faith. And so I think it has relevance when we talk about apologetics as both defense and discourse. One of the things I came up with, that there's essentially about seven personas in the U.S., and this was only a U.S. study, uh, that exists in regards to people's posture towards faith. So a persona is just a caricature or a profile of a group of people and kind of where they stand in relation to faith. On one end of the spectrum was what was called the anti-dogmatic, which is actually a growing group in our country today. What is an anti-dogmatic? What that means is, I know what you Christians stand for, I know your dogma, and I stand completely opposed and against it. They are utterly against, utterly opposed to at least whatever they think we believe about Christ and Christianity. So that's the anti-dogmatic. So they're at one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum is just simply the faithful follower of Christ. And we might say a true disciple, a true follower, somebody that has embraced him as their Lord and Savior, and they're, they're genuinely following him day by day, and, and not only seeking just to follow him, but to also help others come to know him. So you can imagine that is the, the other end of the spectrum. And in the middle, there's a host of people. The one just over from the anti-dogmatic is what was labeled comfortable. Meaning, you know, I know you're there, Christians. I know the church is down the street from my house, and I just don't care. I'm comfortable where I am. I'm comfortable in my life. I'm comfortable with my belief system. And I don't see any relevance to what you stand for or what you proclaim. The anti-dogmatic and the comfortable are probably not the people you're going to have the most conversations with regarding apologetics. It takes probably some level of interest in at least religion or faith and spirituality to want to engage in a discourse about the defense or the reasonableness of a particular faith. So I think there's actually three personas that you'll find yourself engaging with that came out of this research. One was labeled the anxious. The anxious. And these are the people that look at life and experience life, and they do live a little bit in fear. There is a high or significant level of anxiety around what the world is like today and what's going on in the world and how it affects them personally. And they're the ones that begin to believe there's got to be something more than what I'm experiencing. They're, they're looking in, but they're also slightly looking out. Does that make sense? I think they'd be open for a good discourse on where this anxiety is trying to actually take them or how they might experience peace and rest or where there might be hope. Another one uh, is called the explorer, just over from the anxious person. 
So the explorer is someone who's genuinely looking at the world religions. They're actually looking at faith, but they're trying to evaluate all the faith claims. They might take a class on comparative religions to see how that shakes out and which one seems to have the most relevance to them. But they're genuinely exploring. They're not just looking in mainly and looking out occasionally. They're largely looking out. And so they would probably be somebody where you could have a good discourse about the reasonableness of our faith. And if I go one more over, I think another person that would be up for a good conversation would label the disillusioned. These are actually people that tasted church, maybe grew up in church, maybe a follower of Jesus or would count themselves as one at one point, but they're completely disillusioned now, either from their experience with the church or something around Christianity that maybe has deeply wounded them or has looked like there's no credibility. It looks like complete hypocrisy but there's a deeper sense of disillusionment and they're kind of stiff arming too, but it's a, it's a little bit of this. <laughs> there's enough of their faith journey that may be still anchored in the church that they haven't rejected it completely, but they are completely disillusioned, maybe with the institution as they see it. And I think they could be up for a good conversation. And then if there is a fourth, it's any probably uh, somebody that's just simply young in their faith. Like we really do need to help those that are young in their faith newer to the faith, build their, the content of their faith so that they can be strong. Just having a conversation uh, during the break that, you know, the, in the information age, there's so much stuff out there, uh, some of it good, a lot of it not so good. And I'm watching it, especially as I've worked with people 35 and below, uh, how it's shaking their faith. And maybe if they even had a pretty good background. Uh, but there's so many things that will challenge what we think and question what we think. And if there's not a way to consider it or to think about it or understand the content of our faith that our salvation must rest upon, then they could fall into one of those other camps, couldn't they? Uh, they could be anxious. They might still be exploring or they could become disillusioned. And so they might be up actually for uh, and maybe in need of a good discourse around the defense of our faith. Then another thing that this research looked at was a six-point scale of belief. So if the personas were actually their self-declared identity in relation to faith, in other words, the anti-dogmatic said, I'm an anti-dogmatic, that was their self-declared position regarding the faith, the scale of belief is where they would put themselves on that scale. And probably the ones that you would encounter most in that six-point scale would be what was called the curious. Again, probably they don't know Jesus, but they're at least looking out. They are curious about religion, spirituality, faith in some way. They may be chasing a hundred different things, but there's a curiosity that's being expressed. And they may be uh, somebody that would be really up for a good conversation. Now, one of the things that was interesting, not only the personas and the scale of belief, but there was something that came out about five behaviors. And I need to show you the next slide before the five behaviors will make sense. And it's this number 84%. This is the statistic that came out of the research that blew me away. Because I assumed um, for the rest of my life, this was about arm wrestling and convincing people even to sit down and have a good conversation with me about Jesus or, or the faith. But what the research came back and said across all these spectrums is that 84% of the people were willing to do two things with Christians. One is to actually have a conversation around spirituality. 84% said they're up for a conversation around spirituality. Now, they did emphasize two things. One, it needs to be a conversation, <laughs> not a lecture, not a monologue, not necessarily a presentation. They want to have a conversation, a true dialogue around this. The other, said that the other thing they said they would do is, and I will join any Christian in going shoulder to shoulder if they're willing to do something good for my city. So if you interpret that correctly, they're saying, listen, we know our cities are a mess, and if the church is trying to do something about it, and they're doing something good for the city, I'll join them in that. I think that actually gives us two opportunities. One's kind of the deed side. If we're doing good deeds for our city, and by the way, we do partner with about 10 or 12 different entities in Central Texas through our church that you can join on a regular occasion and take people with you and do good for the city. That's kind of the good deeds part of our faith. But the other side is the good news part of our faith. It's both word and deed. They'll have the conversation with you, and that conversation would probably be enhanced 
if you actually were shoulder to shoulder out serving refugees down in Travis Heights, where we have prayer walks every week and where we now provide medical care with a, a bus that we helped purchase for Afghan women that live in that complex. I could see those conversations being greatly enhanced by saying, hey, come go with me as we serve other people who are or maybe marginalized or in need or they're new to this country or, and we'll be the arms of Christ to them. And the research said they'll do that. Is that a hand? Yeah. Could be. No, I, I think you would probably often, um, i trying to remember the nuances of the research, I think mainly you would find agnostics, atheists in that camp. Um, or they may have some version of a spirituality that doesn't include Christ or maybe any of the world religions. It might be more of a New Age philosophy that's centered mainly on self, but still stand strongly opposed to the organized church as they see it. But I think it would include largely agnostics and atheists too. That's a good question. But does the 84% encourage you? I hope it does. At one level, it shouldn't surprise us because I believe, and I think you do too if you think about it, theologically, everybody was created to worship. Everybody was created to worship. And by the way, everybody does worship. Everybody worships. They may not worship the true God, but we were created to worship, and I believe everybody does worship. So it shouldn't surprise us necessarily that people would be up if they were approached in a proper way, at least according to how they understand it, uh, for a good conversation. And therefore, we need to know some things so we can have that good conversation uh, to lend credibility to what we say we believe. And so this is where I think this enters in, and I tried to give you a little bit of a snapshot of who some of the people might be, but now we've got to go back to the five behaviors. So let me go backwards for just a minute. Because here's what the 84% also said, and I didn't give you the total statistic. It said, we'll do those two things if... <laughs> there was a big if, and the if revolved around the five behaviors. If we're approached in a particular way. Now, when I share, I'm only going to share three of the behaviors because I think they're the most relevant ones. You're going to hear me say these and think, well, of course. The problem is we don't tend to do this very well. Their experience of us as Christians don't actually uh, give, them credit, give us credibility or give them a, 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 a sense that they could actually engage with us. So here's the three behaviors I'll share with you I think relate most to what we're talking about. One, they said, be present and listen. Be present and listen. What does presence mean? It means we're giving them our full attention. Do you know that both in Greek and Hebrew in the Bible, whenever you see the English word presence, it's almost 100% of the time uh, transliterated from the word that simply means face. Think about it. If, if, I, if she has my presence, this means I'm giving her my full face. I'm not doing this. I'm not looking up over here. I, she has my presence, and I have hers because I have her face and she has my face. There's actually something about that that screams attentiveness, care, understanding, because I'm willing to have a face-to-face -face encounter. So that's the idea of presence, but they're also saying, would you listen to me? Don't contradict me necessarily. Don't condemn my understanding. Just listen. Start off by listening. It's really at the heart of what a conversation is about. It's an exchange. It's not just, again, a monologue. But they said that's the first point. Second one is this, listen and find common ground. They said this. And because we're all human beings, there is common ground. You may think you have little common ground with somebody maybe that's homeless or somebody that's in a marginalized community or somebody that's an agnostic or atheist, but I promise you have a lot of common ground. We go through the same things in a broken world as broken people, and if we'll listen well, we'll find the points of commonality. And often that's our bridge to meeting needs, serving them, and talking about Jesus. Well, we find the common ground. And then third, and they said this often and kind of loudly, talk like a real person. And what they actually meant with that is quit using your Christianese. I don't even know what you're talking about anyway when you use church words. So sometimes we, uh, when we presented this research, we say uh, quit talking like people in the pews. Use words for real people. But that even gets down sometimes to theological terms. Sometimes they don't know what the word sin means. I have one friend 
who's tried to reframe it. Now, he lives in Portland, Oregon, so there's a reason he needs to reframe it a little bit, uh, but not unlike Austin. And he's, he way he defines sin to his audience is, is trying to find life where there is no life. For him, that's really resonated with 20-somethings and 30-somethings in his context. All of a sudden, they get sin, trying to find life where there is no life. Now, eventually, does he have to go farther than that? Sure. But just the word sometimes has lost its meaning in our current, current context. So are we even understanding of the words we're using so that we can actually have a good conversation that makes sense to the other person? So sometimes it's around our theological jargon. You know, sometimes it's, it's words that we just tend to use in these four walls, but we take it out there too, and it's, it's actually kind of confusing and it kind of clutters the conversation. So the 84% does have one hitch. It is the big if. Will we show up in such a way that we're fully present, fully listening, trying to find some common ground that we can both resonate with, and change our language enough so that they can understand what we're talking about, that we're actually trying to connect and make sense uh, in language they understand. So that was the idea around uh, the five behaviors and tied to the 84%. So here's another question I want you, before we go to this piece, um, and we talk about the 21st century, talk again to your neighbor about the answer to this question, just discuss it. How does this research that I just shared with you, and I just gave you a snippet of it, but what you heard, how does this inform your belief and use of apologetics, or how might it? So I know you don't know everything about apologetics yet, because there's seven more weeks to go, but even from what you understand right now, um, how do you think this research can inform the value and use of apologetics in light of the research and the audience I kind of described for you? So just discuss that with your neighbor for a minute, and I'll call us back. What's the value? How could it be used?
Okay, let's bring it back. Anything interesting that you talked about? Anything that you'd want to note that was just kind of a good point out of your conversation about how that research may inform either your desire to learn more about apologetics or your use of apologetics or anything that came up? Yeah, it should be okay, right? With those 84%. I think it can take some of the fear away. I don't know if you're, you're like me, but a lot of times I leave the house and think, nobody wants to hear this stuff. <laughs> and it's just probably representative of my own fear. Uh, but they actually do. So it is okay to engage and to have a conversation. Take that step of faith and see what happens. I mean, at the end of the day, they're really not rejecting you. Remember what Peter said? Jesus will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to many. It's, it's more about who him than it is about us. Okay, what else came up? Anything else? This is you thought about it, talked about it? Okay. Well, I hope the research encourages you in many ways that it's possible that there are people out there, even in those personas and those, that scale of belief, that, that really are looking. They're genuinely searching. We can pray that God would lead us exactly to those people. I think they're probably all around us. Uh, by the way, there's another piece of social science research by a guy named Robin Dunbar. Anybody ever heard the Dunbar number? Heard of the Dunbar number? Sometimes you hear about this in social science in college or something. British uh, social science researcher. He would say every person on the planet has a relational network somewhere between 100 and 150 people. When I first heard that, I was like, no way, I do not have. <laughs> and he went on to say, well, no, this doesn't mean you're good friends tight with 150 people. What it means is these are people that you would encounter probably on a weekly or at least every other week basis. You may know their name, you may not yet, but they're in your circle of influence because you see them all the time. And as I understood that, I began to look around and realize, oh, yeah, I see the guy at my cleaners who's from Nepal every other week. I see the gal that waits on me at Panera every week. <laughs> uh, so something about me. Yeah, I, I, there's certain people. And then I, I see Wayne, who's my next-door neighbor from mainland China, every week. I see my neighbors behind me, Kurt and Lori from California, the, the, the biggest migration that's happened in the state of Texas, every, all the time. I, there, I do have at least 100, if not 150 people that I see on a regular basis, and so do you. And I've told people many times, it's a unique relational network to you. You don't have my network, and I don't have yours. What does the Lord want to do in stewarding that network? How many of them might be up for a conversation? I'll give you one more thing that came out of the research in a minute as we get to the 21st century reality that may be a good starting point. For you, Because often I'm asked, what do you say first? Well, I'm going to give you something you can at least try on and say first to get into that conversation. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about this idea uh, of 21st century reality, both ministry and posture. We've already said some of these things, so this is in your notes again, but just to double down. First, the ministry of apologetics. It is for the follower of Christ, I really think first and foremost, and then it's certainly for the not yet follower of Christ. But again, it's, it's first and foremost for us because we can still feel sometimes overwhelmed by doubt or confusion or fear or instability just because of the nature of life in this broken world. Our hope has to rest on something. Hope against hope is not hope. It has to have some foundation to it. And I trust through these next seven weeks that will really build your faith. Uh, that can give you a greater sense of hope. And hope, again, is always anticipation of something sure that's coming. So it's first and foremost for us. But again, obviously, we've talked about it's for the not yet follower of Christ because it gives us a framework in which to have these conversations. And listen, they don't have, there's only certain content that really matters that salvation either stands on or falls. Some things, uh, and you may have heard this framework before, first, th uh, first world, or, I'm losing it, first order, second order, third order things. Sometimes we take third order things and make them first order things, and we actually put a stumbling block in the path of people uh, in coming to faith. Like a third order thing might be, well, do you, do you like uh, contemporary worship or do you like the old hymns? Because that, that salvation rests on that. It's like, well, obviously not. You may not like it. You might not like how loud it is in there, but that has nothing to do with salvation. That's a third order thing at best. So we don't want to divide about that when we're talking to our, our friend that may need to come to know Jesus. If we're talking about that Jesus claimed to be God and was he or not, that's a first order thing. 
our faith actually rests on the deity of Christ. It rests on his resurrection. It rests on the virgin birth. To be able to even rest on those things, we have to know that our, our Bible is infallible, that it, it actually can hold the content of our faith that we rest upon. Uh, those things are first order things. Those are some of the things that we'll talk about in here over the next few weeks. So it gives us that framework and really the necessary framework, but we don't need to necessarily go beyond it to see people come to faith. And then the rest of it's sanctification, right? We're, we're still growing too. We're still trying to understand the second and third order stuff. So it's really homing in on the first order of things. And we need to make sure that we're focused on the things that matter too. And then you notice that there, I put down here this idea of cultural and evidential apologetics. Those are kind of two fields of studies. Mainly in here, we're going to be looking at evidential apologetics, meaning what's the evidence for our faith? What are those first order things that our faith absolutely rests on? But uh, it's interesting, uh, probably what's being confronted more than anything today is this idea of cultural apologetics. Uh, both matter. Matter of fact, cultural may be the front door for some, but eventually it's going to get around to evidential. Because if they're still going to come to faith, they still have to put their faith in someone that's based on something uh, that's truth and that matters. So even if there's a cultural front door, eventually I think it'll come around to the things that we're talking about in this class. Uh, Another piece of the research that came out of the Cyrano research was this, that um, almost nobody didn't believe in the historicity of Christ. If you asked them, did Jesus exist, almost all of them say, absolutely. Yeah, he existed. So their question wasn't, did he exist? Their primary question, does he matter? Does he matter? That's a very different question. It's not even the question is, was he God? Does he matter? Great, he's a historical figure, probably a good man, great teacher. Does he matter? And what they're getting at is some of these cultural elements. How does that impact affect my life today? There's one writer that I've really grown to appreciate over the last couple of years, a guy named Carl Truman, uh, is a, somewhat of a cultural apologist, uh, philosopher, theologian. And um, one of the things that he's recognized that he would say that we've kind of been in this 300-year run that's brought us to this current moment that actually some of the things that we're experiencing today and seeing in our society have kind of a 300-year pathway that got us here. But he sums up some of our cultural reality. Uh, I put it in the notes there um, this way, that one, we now have an over-psychologized self. And you know this to be true. The second bullet is we've, uh, now we're in a season of self-declared identities. I can be whoever or whatever I want to be. There is no objective truth. If I want to be a woman, I am a woman or name your identity. Uh, so this idea of self declared identities. And that in that, he would say we've lost our sacred center. Uh, he kind of traces a lot of this back to uh, a few philosophers, but he, he would say that through that 300-year run, we've kind of arrived at this moment. And he would even say that what it's really produced more than anything, it hasn't produced peace and rest, it's produced even more anxiety and unrest. But we're having a hard time seeing it, even as we try and express our freedom and live out uh, any way we want. So sometimes the front door will be these cultural realities, and there is a field of study that would be in that realm of cultural apologetics. But I do think eventually, for many, it's going to come around to the evidence that our faith rests upon so they can understand who Jesus really is, that they might come to saving faith in him. So that's the ministry of apologetics. The posture we've been talking a lot about too, but I really would sum it up probably in one word, and that would be humility. Probably the greatest danger to studying apologetics and even engaging in apologetic discourse on our part is pride. I know a lot of apologetics or apologists, is there a question? I'm sorry, I missed it. Yep. Carl Truman. Carl Truman. And he's got a few books out, but um, actually they're all kind of on the same topic at the moment. <laughs> There's a longer one and a shorter one. So we have to be careful of this danger, I think, that can result uh, by what we know and becoming prideful about it. We have to maintain this posture of humility. And then I listed four things that I think will really matter. Two of them I've already talked about, our presence and our voice. Will we be fully present with people? Will we be face-to-face -face with them? Will we listen? Will our voice, 
because it's not only the content of our words, but even our tone, uh, demonstrate our humility and our love for Jesus to other people. Then there is the evidence. The evidence matters. That's the idea behind evidential apologetics. But then finally, story matters. Story matters. So here's where I get back and give you the research piece of what you can say first if you want to have a good conversation with somebody or at least begin that, that journey. Uh, this came out of the research as well and was a little disappointed with the researchers because they were looking for something way more profound <laughs> than what came out because it's kind of simple. But they came back with one statement and said this, hey, sometime I'd love to hear more about your story. There's two geniuses behind this, actually. First is the word sometime. You're not buttonholing somebody. You're not trying to put them on the spot right then. It's sometime. It's kind of an open invitation. But it engages them at a narrative level. And narrative is very, very powerful today. I think it always has been, but it seems really prominent today. Uh, By the way, it taps into something else I think is God ordained. We all want to know and be known. We all want to know and be known. People want to tell you their story. And they'd love to tell it to somebody who's actually willing to listen. So if you want to try on something to say first, even with people you don't know very well, or people you do know really well, but maybe you don't know their story, hey, sometime I'd love to hear more about your story. Let's grab coffee. Now it's still on you to take the initiative, right, and let's, let's do the coffee or lunch or whatever it is. But then sit down and let them tell you their story. You know what will happen, don't you? They're going to ask about your story eventually. You're going to get an opportunity to talk about some things you care about and what God's done in your life. But I think that humble posture of starting with them and being other-centered and letting them tell their story first sets the stage. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that actually, yeah, that's actually a good second question. It actually was validated by the research too. So and usually the way the research postured, if you didn't hear him, uh, tell me something about your spiritual journey. And usually what, the, what came back on the research was, especially if you know people a little bit better, that can be a decent lead question. If you don't know them that well, then you may want to step one step back and say, hey, tell me more about your story. If you don't know them a little bit better, I haven't heard anything about your spiritual journey. Tell me more about your spiritual journey. And again, that's not a very confronting question. It's a fairly easy question. I've, I've tried that, and sometimes people say don't have one, or yeah, I grew up doing this or that. Or, but it does usually reciprocate again, just like the first question. Usually there's an exchange there that starts a conversation, and you can begin to find out what you hear through story is you hear the same journey we've all been on, meaning a journey of blessings and wounds. We all have one. Uh, we've all had good and bad experiences in the church, actually, too. <laughs> we've all had them. Uh, we didn't disregard the church, but we've had bumps and bruises, just like everybody else. You begin to hear things that you can then connect to, and that may lead to the content of our faith. You know, now, you know, hopefully going through this class, you have something that you can say that's reasonable and will help people. So, uh, yeah, these are questions that you can ask and can help you get down that road of, of conversation. Uh, it's interesting, there's two friends of mine, just to kind of illustrate something else about this, and we're going to wrap up pretty quick. Uh, one friend of mine, is he's just probably one of the most compassionate guys I know. He's actually a film writer, TV producer, lives out in Oregon. Uh, but he has a, uh, in his writing, he has a very close Jewish friend. And he says, you know, she said, you Christians, you, you guys are always looking for the answers, but you don't ever consider the questions. <laughs> and he felt kind of like, uh, maybe you're right, tell me more. <laughs> you know? And she said, well, in the Jewish understanding, we actually value the questions. Matter of fact, rabbis encourage us to ask questions as a validity of your faith. But if you don't question your faith, it's probably not valid. He goes, but you Christians seem to always want just answers. Answers, answers, answers. And he walked away saying, you know, I think she's on to something. <laughs> that actually, and you think about it in the context of what we're trying to do with this class, the questions do really matter. And when somebody asks you a sincere question, don't dismiss it. Take it as a very sincere question. Now, do we have answers that could help? I think so. But sometimes we don't value the question that much. And she was just trying to help him see that, hey, the questions matter too. 
I have another friend who's a very close friend that I've done a lot of work with. Um, she's a PhD person, one of those types, and she um, is very astute in her faith. And she was in a cab one day in the city of Chicago, and her cab driver was Muslim. And just to point that we're not the only ones that are evangelistic about our faith, uh, she, he asked her what she did and why she was in Chicago, so I'm going to this conference, it's a conference for Christians, and he immediately got, according to her, really nervous and kind of breathing heavily, and he was fumbling around with his phone, and she was getting a little concerned because he's still on the interstate coming in from O'Hare, and like, he's going fast. And finally, he hands her his phone, and it's a video all about Allah and Islam, and he's trying to convert her. He says, you need to know Allah. I think God put you in my car so that you'd know Allah. And Cass, my friend's kind of feisty, she goes, no, I think I'm in your car because God wants you to know Jesus. <laughs> now, I don't know if she would even look back now and think that was this really healthy, great discussion, but it was kind of an exchange. She said, man, I walked away thinking, why are we uh, so fearful of communicating our faith? Others are not, apparently. You know, and so she was just kind of emboldened by that again to say, hey, it's okay. We need to engage well and we need to engage respectfully, but boy, there's others out there that are trying to win hearts and minds too, trying to be persuasive. Okay, well then, um, the final thing that you'll see is really the purpose of this class. There's three stated purposes that when we were putting this whole class together that we felt like would be the most important things that you could walk away with. One, to strengthen your faith. So I hope you've understood that tonight. I've probably said it many different ways tonight. Second, to help you engage culture with confidence and humility. Don't forget the passage of 1 Peter. This was the oppressor Rome with all its emperor worship, all its idolatry, uh, trying to weigh in and kind of uh, to get rid of this thing called Christianity at the time when this was being written, at least sporadically at that point. It would get more systematic later. But also finally to be an attractive witness to the gospel of Jesus. But all three of those things matter. Our faith, our engagement with culture, we really shouldn't retreat in fear. We need to literally engage. Sometimes I teach the sharing your faith class here at church. I tell the people up front, my only goal is to get you going again. I just want you engaged. I don't think you can mess this up this bad if you'll just move towards people. Because <laughs> um, we tend not to. We tend to retreat. We kind of stay in our bubbles. We need to engage. And I hope this class will give you some confidence in that. But then also, how can you be that attractive witness with good content to your faith that's reasonable and that you can adequately explain to someone else. Okay, Jeff, we are done for tonight. Hello. There we go. You're on. Gary, thank you. Um, Gary just mentioned the class, Sharing Your Faith. It's coming up, what, four weeks from now? Um, something like that. Five weeks from now? Yeah. It starts towards the end of October. So if you're interested in taking that class, it's more basic evangelistic method. Is that the best way to say it? You can go to austinrich.org slash equip. Same place, basically, you signed up for this class. You can find information on that. We've also got a uh, Bible study basics class coming up in a couple of weeks that uh, Carrie, his wife, and I help teach. So uh, I would love for you to take part in that if you want some, some skills. That's a really good class, she said. We like her. So, um, man, that was great. It's always good to be reminded, just that foundation of that. You know, I, I always love the reminder, too, of don't talk, listen. You know, I mean, for I don't know how you guys are, but for me, that's, I forget to leave space for someone else to talk in that setting sometimes. I'm so excited to tell them what I know and forgetting to ask what they think or what their questions actually are. So such, such great reminders. Thanks, Gary. Uh, John Craig, who I introduced earlier, is teaching the next two weeks. And I kind of drill uh, several layers deeper just on that posture piece, tactics, part one, part two is the next two weeks. In fact, I forgot to tell you earlier, the first page in your uh, notebook there is your syllabus. So if you want to know kind of the layout of the classes, the homework assignments, uh, the, the reading, whether it's post-reading from tonight or pre-reading for next week, it's all spelled out in there. And when you uh, forget where that is, uh, you know how to email us and we will be glad to remind you. I want to introduce you to one more uh, lady, Sarah Anderson uh, back there. Most of y'all met her on your way in tonight, but she's our host uh, for this class. So you won't see me every week or Joey every week, but you will see her 
every week. She actually studied apologetics at Liberty, is that right? So uh, she has some pretty good answers to some questions. So if you have uh, questions along the way, don't be afraid to walk up and uh, test Sarah on her knowledge and stuff. So uh, anyway, it's 8.04, so uh, we gave you, uh, what, 11 minutes back tonight, so we'll, we'll just take that next week. We'll just add that on to next week. So um, anyway, uh, again, feel free to email jeff.moore at austinridge or joey.writer at austinridge.org. We would love to answer any questions uh, you have along the way. And uh, I'll pray us out and let you guys go home. God, thanks for tonight. Thanks for Gary, his wisdom, uh, just his approach, uh, and just his, his faithfulness. His, I, I love knowing the integrity behind the things that he's saying tonight. And so pray tonight that uh, as we rest, God, we would trust you. Uh, God, fill our minds uh, and help us to, uh, to continue to think about the things we learned tonight. Most importantly, help him put us in practice, into practice in a way that honors Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. All right, you guys are dismissed.